Welcome everyone. We've got today um, Dr. Becky Smethurst, who is an award-winning astrophysicist and science communicator at the University of Oxford. Becky specializes in how galaxies co-evolve with their supermassive black holes. Um, and she's also the holder for the Royal Astronomical Society's Research Fellowship, which she was awarded in 2022. So today we have Becky speaking on science communication and looking at your bio, your achievements in this field are too numerous to detail here. So I'm just going to pick out a few. Um, Becky has a YouTube channel, Dr. Becky, which has over 500,000 subscribers who engage with your videos on weird objects in space, the history of science and space news. Becky is also an author of multiple books, um, presents the RAS Supermassive podcast, as well as regularly appearing on national television and radio. So I'll hand over to you now, Becky, for your seminar. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you so much to the organisers of MIST for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm an RAS fellow at the University of Oxford, and I'm researching the growth of supermassive black holes in the absence of mergers with like low redshift optical studies, if you want to put me in a little sort of astro box. Uh, but I'm also Dr. Becky on YouTube and across social media. So I've been invited here today to share my experience doing outreach on social media platforms, which does not provide the freedom that you might assume because of the recommendation algorithms that sort of rule over these platforms. And while they can be good for people discovering content, they also police who sees what content. And in the science sphere, that actually is quite concerning. Now, these recommendation algorithms are true of Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, threads, whatever, pick your favorite social media platform. I'm going to focus there on YouTube because that's the one that I've spent the most time on, like producing content for, but also the most time analyzing as well, because over on YouTube, I am your friendly neighborhood astrophysicist, where once a week I post a video, either recapping the latest, latest astronomy news or explaining something to do with JWST and its latest findings, or perhaps covering some sort of unsolved mystery, just whatever I want to chat about that week, whatever paper I've read or whatever seminar I've been to that's, you know, given me an idea of what to, to make a video on. Now I set up this channel back in October 2018 and it's grown from a handful of subscribers then to around about 750,000 in just under six years like thanks to that consistently posting one video a week where possible at least around you know, research sometimes there's a telescope deadline and I might skip a video that week <laughs> or maybe I'll go on holiday in terms of like home life as well. It's a it's a big balance sort of keeping that um, around home life and research life. It's not always easy. Uh, but as my channel has grown, I've actually found that it's not just like members of the public who'd recognize me from that, but it's also that my colleagues might know me now more for this work rather than uh, my research work. So I hope you're going to give me just this moment to advertise here that I do work on the growth of supermassive black holes and their co-evolution with their galaxies. I've shown recently that the majority of growth occurs in the absence of galaxy mergers with any co-evolution still regulated by AGN feedback, even in merger-free galaxies. And a lot of this work is made possible due to like careful galaxy sample selection as well. So that's in my role as deputy project scientist on the Galaxy Zoo team. So if any of you are interested in collaborating on this or know of any colleagues who would be, then please send them my way. But back to YouTube. In October 2018, when I first started posting on social media, my uh, rather naive viewpoint was just sort of build the website and they will come, right? I am a young-ish <laughs> female scientist and all of the other young females will flock my way wanting to hear about science from me. But that didn't happen. Uh, these are my current demographic statistics from the past year of posting on my channel, which had a total of 32 million views or so in that time. And you can see around 10% of my viewers are female. So that what's that, like 3 million are female. The majority of my viewers are 35 to 44 years old, rather than the 18 to 24 demographic. I originally thought that I would reach at least sort of like the under 30 demographic. Unsurprisingly, they are mostly from English speaking countries, the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, although there's a large percentage from India also. And you can see that the majority of people who watch are also not subscribed to the channel. I think that's something that people don't necessarily like think about when they think of social media, but 
that is a good thing because if you're only ever reaching your subscribers, you're never reaching a, a new audience. You're not reaching new people all the time. So that this is a good thing that they're not subscribed the majority. Now, there are some caveats to a lot of these statistics that you see here. The one that really sort of I've been trying to tackle is the gender balance that you see in the top corner there. And if you think about the caveats to this, unless you've told Google your gender, it is assumed based on your Google search history and your YouTube search history, which as we can all imagine is, is not probably the most accurate. So perhaps there's some issues with the gender split there. You could also have like a shared household YouTube account that's registered under, you know, uh, a male name and a male account, but you might have kids watching that would be female or a partner that's watching it that might be female. Or perhaps just like women watching along with someone, if it's astronomy as a hobby, they share, it will register as male. All with those caveats in mind to that gender stat in that top left-hand corner, I still don't think that's enough to account for the, the great disparity there. It might bring it, you know, a few percent higher in terms of the number of women watching, but I, it's not going to bring it to the 50-50 that we would all like it to be. Now, most of these stats do look similar to how they did when I first started back in October 2018, except for that gender split in that top left corner. When I started putting videos out, this is what my stats looked like in sort of the, you know, first six months of regular posting. So I'd get maybe like a few hundred, maybe a few thousand views per video. And it was 0.5% of the viewership uh, was, was female. So I have had to work to get that gender split up to 10%. <laughs> so when I, I see that number, you know, from before that I just showed, I'm almost like, oh, so disappointed. I'm like, oh, so disheartening when you, you know, as, as science communicators, we do want to reach more women. But I have to remember, it's come a long way in six years, <laughs> but it was not easy. And the reason that it's not easy is because you're fighting against the YouTube recommendation algorithm. Now, Thankfully, the YouTube recommendation algorithm is not some big secret, unlike the TikTok recommendation algorithm, which is. The YouTube algorithm is described in a research paper by Covington, Adams, and Sargin from 2016. And essentially, it's a neural net. It decides what to recommend to you next in order to keep you on YouTube for the longest possible time. That is sort of the, the end goal for the algorithm. It has had some issues, I think it hit the news uh, sort of at the end of the 2010s because a study came out showing how the end of that chain was always a conspiracy theory video like Flat Earth or Electric Universe or something like that. YouTube have now rectified that as part of the algorithm, but they have kept the, the sort of basic uh, recommendation sort of settings in it. Because how it works is it takes information on what you've watched before, what you've searched for before, your geographic location, your age, and your gender to decide what to recommend that you watch next. So if you are, let's say, a 17-year-old female logging onto YouTube for the first time, it doesn't have any of this information about you. So it bases its recommendations on what other 17-year-old females in your geographic location are also watching. So unless other females in their geographic location are also searching for science content or unless that specific young woman searches for science content she is very unlikely to be recommended anything essentially like, any science content so it's essentially excluding her from the scientific narrative based on her gender and her age alone which is a scary thought for us science communicators that essentially just because this kid logs on they're not going to be uh recommended anything scientific based on that information alone not based on their interests or anything like that just based on their age and gender it's exactly what we're fighting against right which is why these algorithms are so they're just a blockade essentially and as you can see neil mohan who's the new uh, actually this is uh, from when they were cpo but now a uh, ceo said 70 percent of content watched by users on youtube is actually determined by the youtube algorithm so it's unlikely, you know, that a kid is going to necessarily see the science content for the first time. 
Now, not only do we get this exclusion of people uh, seeing the content for, for this reason from the algorithm, but the algorithm then leads to the elevation of white male voices as well. And I don't think this was necessarily YouTube's intention when they set this up, but this was just the, the natural progress of the algorithm. So this is a, a, a top 25 science YouTubers by subscriber count, and these numbers were correct uh, last year in February 2023. Every single one of these channels is led by one, if not two, white males. And if you work your way down, the first females we get to are the mathematicians that present on uh, Numberphile, which is a, a channel that gets lots of different mathematicians to present different videos. Um, and so you've got the likes of Holly Krieger and Hannah Fry in there. But ultimately, the channel is most famous for like James Grimes and Matt Parker. It's very like UK based channel. It's a great channel if you, if you haven't checked it out before. Um, and it's also run and, and like everything is filmed and produced and edited and posted by a man called Brady Haran. The first truly female led science channels are Simone Yetch and Diana Cowan of Physics Girl at number 24 and 25. And unfortunately, Diana is now suffering from long COVID. She's completely bedridden. She's not making any videos at this time. So you can see how it is a problem that if you're going to YouTube, you're more likely to be recommended a science video from one of these large channels, and it's going to be led by uh, a white male. And there's been studies that have shown that on average on YouTube, male-led channels are watched by more male viewers and vice versa. On average, obviously, that doesn't apply to my channel here, but on average, that is what happens. So we do get this sort of a little bit of a vicious cycle in the recommendation algorithm that elevates male voices, right? Because men make the science content, more men are then recommended science content, men watch science content, and then more men make science content, and so on and so on. And so the algorithm has essentially learned even more so, it's sort of been ingrained in it, that the science content is what typically men like to watch. Also, nearly every single person on this list is white. So it's interesting to think how racial biases might have also entered into the algorithm. Perhaps, again, it's not trained in. This was not YouTube's like intention, but it's still been learned due to societal biases in the same way that like Amazon's Kindle recommendation recommends white authors to white people through nothing that they coded in there themselves, but due to societal biases. Perhaps also there are people that have considered, you know, how close is the geographic location actually like what sort of scale is it going down to that the YouTube algorithm actually works on and is redlining in the US of certain geographical locations like contributing to this. That is a whole other separate issue. It's one I'm not as familiar with, so I'm not going to focus on it here. My efforts have been sort of the, the gender split, but if anyone else wants to talk about that at the end of the talk, I'm uh, definitely interested. So... With all that said, <laughs> what do you do when you're fighting against an all-powerful recommendation algorithm that has apparently learnt sexism and racism? <laughs> you're like, you can't help but uh, laugh to keep from crying, can you? You've got to trick it. You've got to trick it and make a video that's packaged on the outside to look like one thing to the algorithm, and then on the inside, bam, blind them with science. So social media algorithms, like social media platforms, right? They're built on trending topics, hashtag trending audios, whatever everyone is talking about. And anything that can cross over the lines from science video into appearing as something else is how you get the algorithm to recommend a piece of content to a different demographic. So that's doing true outreach and not in reach to the already interested, the people that are going to turn up to the astronomy lectures that we put on, you know, and are going to fill uh, the seats of those lecture theatres. We want to reach the people who've decided that, oh, a science museum is not for me because I'm not smart enough for science. And it's like, yes, you are. Everyone can be involved and everyone can get excited about this. So doing true outreach. That is easier on other platforms. For example, on TikTok, the algorithm is based on trending audio. So you can, you know, make a science video with a trending audio sound, like a song or, or you know, a clip from a TV show that you, you know, mouth the words to, lip sync to. And people have had a lot of success with that. That's not my sort of sphere that I like to exist in. I definitely exist in more of the waffle sphere of making longer content on YouTube. Um, so again, that's what I'm going to focus on here. So how, how do you fight that uh, on YouTube, for example? So I'm going to talk about some of the things that I have attempted to do. Some good, some 
bad. I'll let you decide which way around they ended up being. But let's start off, as all scientists do, with a control. This is one of the most popular hardcore science videos, that I like to call them, that I've, I think I've ever made. It's about MOND, right? An alternative theories of gravity and whether dark matter is even necessary in our models of the universe anymore. And this was based on a research paper from my colleague, Harry Desmond, who's at Portsmouth, but sometimes also at Oxford. It is, let's be honest, the peak of YouTube science clickbait without being actual clickbait. <laughs> I think it's what us in the business have termed legit bait because you know you ask this question like new evidence against dark matter like that is literally what the paper is about and that is what the video is about so you get this you know uh actual uh what's the word like you, you know you click on it and you, you you get what you expect rather than something completely different right and we actually do talk about whether like there is evidence against dark matter it's actually you know fulfilling when you click on it and it works right this legit bait it, it gets people to click and watch it intrigues them and it sparks their curiosity. And it get a lot of views. Of, of 2021, it was 750,000 views. I think it's it's now over a million. But as you can see, two and a half percent of the viewers were female. And this is a trend that I've noticed from all my more science heavy videos that when I sort of put these hardcore science videos out, the gender split tends to skew to even less female and more male. And again, I think that's a product of the algorithm. Like it skews less than that average percentage that we saw before of around about 10%. Uh, and similarly, like here's a video from last year when the Sagittarius A star image was released. I answered all the FAQs that I'd seen people asking across social media, like, why is it orange? Why was it different to the M87 image? Why was it blurry? What are the three blobs? Like, can we observe it with JD Bruce T? All those kind of things. Again, had over like about 700,000 views, which was great, but the majority of people at reach, 35 to 44, only 6% were female. The algorithm has learned that this kind of science content appeals to that audience. And so we'll just continually serve it mainly to them. And it's not just my channel. I've spoken to a lot of people who, you know, run their channels like um, Veritasium, PBS, Space Time. They all have similar statistics to this. So instead, what happens if we try and make a science heavy video, but trick the algorithm into thinking that it is not science heavy? So for all intents and purposes, your content's not changing. It's just it's just the packaging that's changing, like the title and the thumbnail and the, the, the metadata in all of the um, descriptions and things like that. So let's start on a positive note. The biggest success story of me ever trying to do this was a day in the life of an astrophysicist. If you've ever been on YouTube, you will know that day in the life videos are rife on there. Like people just want to watch a day in the life of a Harvard student or a day in the life of a fitness guru or a London lawyer. And it's like, usually they consist of like, I start my morning at 5 a.m. and I go on a jog and then I do some yoga and I have some cold oats that I prep the night before and I then do three hours of study. And then, oh, look at the beautiful poke bowl I'm having for lunch, right? They're very, <laughs> they're very thin on the ground and they're very almost like, um, sort of like they're supposed to be inspirational I guess or aspirational for the day that you wish you had but instead you just lay in bed till 8 a.m before you got up um, and what I realized from watching these day in the life videos right myself is that actually the majority of them are being made and posted and presented by women and if you look the comment section on those videos are also dominated by women which is not something that I find with my comment section at all so I figured if I could make a video like that, perhaps women would, you know, find it a familiar space, a safe space that they could, you know, watch and comment and feel included and that the algorithm would also put out to women as well. So if I want to reach more women on YouTube, I figured I need to make a day in the life video. But I realized with a video like that, there's so much room to get science content in there. So from explaining what an actual, what an astrophysicist actually does <laughs> to explaining my own research on galaxies and supermassive black holes, to explaining the M87 black hole image that had just come out, because I recorded this on the day that uh, Heino Falco was visiting Oxford and, and gave a seminar and also a, a public talk on the image as well. And the good news is, like, I, I think it works. Like, it can be done in terms of reaching more female viewers and a younger audience as well. So the female viewership for this video is over 28%. 
And the majority of viewers, 43%, are 18 to 24 year olds rather than the 35 to 44 that's my typical demographic. And like, I just want to reiterate, this isn't like a, you know, absolute car crash of, you know, the, um, the thing, well, who was it that did it? It was um, like, fire, was it the firemen? What's the name of like people who fight fires? Firefighters in the UK, like the, the, the whole people who govern that, right? When they said, let's take a hairdryer part together to learn about science, right? That was a huge debacle from the fire department, like back in the 2000, 2010s, I think. Like this isn't packaged as, science for girls right this is just me making the same content I would normally but packaging it slightly different so the YouTube algorithm is like yeah I will show it to more young people and to more women because I know that they like day in the life videos and I would recommend those to women anyway and I think like I mean it's fun to see that you know it got reached this many women and it got over three million views and sort of took apart that idea of a academia is this ivory tower that's very opaque you know it tried to make it a bit more transparent and so with YouTube it you know while it can be hard to get lost in the numbers it's fun to look at comments as well and I did see a lot more comments from women on this video from saying they've been thinking about you know going into higher education and becoming a researcher and you know yeah it's cemented that they want to do that um, or as a high school student like they've been more motivated to keep going or, you know, they're a single mother who wants to become an astrophysicist, but again, it inspired them to do that. Um, wh whatever it might be, you know, saying astrophysics has always been a passion of mine and the toying idea of getting a degree. And, you know, you hope that perhaps something like this, having reached them, will encourage more women to get into the field, which is a lot of the reason why, you know, why I do this is to be sort of that example for people to be say, we exist and you can do this. Um, and so, although this video, I will say, um, I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing what I did with this video because I was very much like, hey, here's the place that I work to 3 million people, which has caused a lot of trouble for me. I'm still very proud of the impact that it's it, it's very clearly had on, on people as well. Um, and you can see also, there is someone who commented saying, finally, a day in the life video that shows the actual job and not someone had for lunch and what they do in the gym. Great. Which was the whole point of this, right, was to, to really showcase the, the science behind it. So I think this worked. And this is why I'd say it was possibly my biggest success story in trying to do this. Here's another example of me trying to do this as well. Meme reviews. They are absolutely rife on YouTube. And personally, I do not get it. Like when did explaining a joke ever become funny or cool to do? Apparently it did, right? So fine, we'll do some meme reviews. And essentially what I get people to do is to send me their astronomy themed memes, uh, which I haven't seen before. And I sort of blind react and laugh at it. And then I explain the basic science behind it. So from you know, why pictures of the moon look so terrible on your phone because, you know, the field of view of, of, of your camera on your phone or this one, for example, on Earth-like planets, uh, Kepler-452b distracting everyone from Kepler-186f. Hopefully you can actually see the comment from a viewer here at the bottom as well that I think really hit the, hit the nail on the head of what I was trying to do, which is that meme review was the Trojan horse to an educational video, which I think is a very good way of putting what I'm trying to do here with the sense of you're making the same science content, but packaging it differently to the algorithm. It's a Trojan horse for the algorithm. I think also another video, another, sorry, commenter commented that they had learned more science watching that meme review video than they did in high school, <laughs> which I don't know if that's a compliment to the video or just a commentary on the US schooling system. <laughs> but I thought that it was, it was, it was quite funny that they made that comment. Uh, anyway, the stats for this video, which is where we were going with this, right, uh, said that this did reach more young people than normal on my channel, remembering that the 35 to 44 age demographic is my average sort of uh, reach for my channel. Here it was 18 to 24 year olds that were the majority that were reached for this video. However, the gender split is not significantly different there. It's up 2% or so. Again, I don't think that's a statistical significance. It's better at least than the dark matter video that we saw before, um, but it's not sort of um, higher than the average you'd see for my channel. So I, I guess a partial success on this one. Another series I started was an astrophysicist reacts series to mostly sci-fi, whether it's a show or a film that had just come out. And again, my thought process here was, 
sci-fi is an entertainment genre, right? Um, and this is something that's very much in the public sphere. It's sort of reaching out to people again in that sphere that they feel comfortable in and bringing the science to them into that specific sphere. And I also figured that this shouldn't really be based on gender, like it shouldn't be biased to gender in terms of who's watching The Expanse, for example. I saw a lot of women in the comment sections of reaction videos for various TV shows. For example, I, I mean, I got this idea from um, Dr. Mike, who is a, a, like a GP in the US who makes reaction videos, for example, to things like Grey's Anatomy and, and House and medical shows. And I was like, yeah, I've got these women watching you know, these reaction videos and, and commenting. So I figured I'd do the same. I would watch the show, record my reactions. Um, it's a very lovely screenshot of me there with my expression. Um, and I'd explain the science and essentially which bits of the science and which bits were fiction, right? Which of the sci-fi, you know, which, where was the split there? Again, with this sort of like Trojan horse of science content. Now, unfortunately, this didn't have the impact that I hoped it would. Apparently, the sci-fi genre is completely gendered. <laughs> so this video only reached 3% uh, of women who were watching this video on the popular show of The, the Expanse on Netflix. I, we kind of managed to bring down the age spread a bit to the 25 to 34 bracket and not the 18 to 24 bracket, which, I mean, when I did consider it, this is probably the target audience for this show. I think I just had a massive awakening about, you know, how much sci-fi is possibly gendered, which I wasn't aware of due to, you know, like the Scully effect from the X-Files and so many of my colleagues in Astro saying that, you know, they'd watch Star Trek and were massively inspired by the women in that show to go into astronomy. I figured it was a non-gendered thing. Apparently not. But I thought, well, what about a sci-fi film with like a female lead then? Because if I'm thinking about all my colleagues who were inspired by sci-fi shows, like with a lot of women in it, then perhaps this would have a similar effect. So I thought contact, right, with Jodie Foster, what a classic. So many people cite that as being like, you know, the, the, the film that inspired them. I had never actually seen it before this. I think it came out just a little bit before my time. So it worked really well for me to react to it. But again, it made the female male split worse and even pushed to an older audience on average as well. Again, you probably remember when the film was released in 1997. So that's why they were drawn to the video. So again, that wasn't as successful. I mean, it still reached like back in 2001, it reached 437,000 men, which is, is great, right? But I think it would have been better if it also reached a couple of hundred thousand extra women on top of that, right? That's, that's what I'm saying. It's not where we don't want the men there. It's just also want it to reach women and the algorithm to recommend it to more women. So what about a more recent sci-fi film with a female lead? I figured maybe it was just the fact that it was released in 1997 that perhaps was uh, the issue here. So I went with Don't Look Up, fronted by Jennifer Lawrence. And I thought, this has got to do better, surely. Well, it did do better than The Expanse or Contact. But again, it only had a 12% female split. Remember, the average is about 10%. So again, we're not really getting to that statistically significant gender split that, that we would like to see from this sort of Trojan horse, um, you know, uh, plan or <laughs> method of trying to trick the social media algorithms. So not quite, you know, the same impact as the day in the life that we saw before. So I was thinking, come on, right, what else can we do? Day in life, meme reactions, sci-fi reactions, what else is big on YouTube? like big video essays analyzing like you know I you know something that's in within a fandom and I was like okay if you're gonna do this you're gonna have to pick a fandom that you are part of and I was like what am I the biggest fan of Taylor Swift <laughs> I got very excited when I realized that the in Taylor Swift's sister albums Folklore and Evermore that came out during the pandemic there are so many space references in there like rare as the glimmer of a comet in the sky for example love you to the moon and to Saturn whatever it might have been and so as a huge Taylor Swift fan I was like let's make a video explaining the science behind those references like taking this lyric here Say explaining, okay, what is a comment? What is a comment? Why are they rare? How rare are they really? Like, when is the next one visible that you might be able to see? And the idea was it would cross over into the Swifties area of the internet that I also feel like I am a part of, right? That I, I sit in the middle of that Venn diagram of astrophysics and Taylor Swift on, online. And I thought, if I can put something in there, will it appeal to both, right? And I also thought, Hopefully it would be recommended to a huge proportion of female viewers as well, because it would appeal to them the most. 
And I was so excited to post this video. <laughs> and given how I have judged all of these previous examples of this Trojan horse method, I think this one can only be described in terms of reaching a more female audience as an epic fail. <laughs> um, also, the majority of viewers were male and over the age of 45 as well. So I think instead of encouraging more women to engage with science content, what I did was encourage older men to listen to Taylor Swift, <laughs> which I mean, in itself is, is an achievement. I think that it, it was something to be proud of that I perhaps exposed them to that. There's some very nice comments on the video as well, saying that they gave the albums a list and really enjoyed them. Um, but I didn't quite manage to engage younger people in the science sort of crossover like I was going for. It doesn't seem to have reached the Swifties part of the internet, sadly, um, which I was uh, I was very sad about. It also doesn't seem to have reached Taylor Swift and her team either, but you know, there's, there's, there's still time before the era store comes to London, um, but we shall see. So, I guess what I'm trying to say with all of this, uh, amongst all of the, the humor and the laughter as well that I, I have to use to keep sort of going and trying to do this, is that I am still learning how to do this as well. Like I can tell you my lessons learned in the hope that it might also help you with your own online engagement as well. Perhaps if you're thinking of starting a social media account or you already have an existing one, you want to drive growth on existing platforms, or you're just thinking about how to reach different audiences. It's just to remember that at the end of the day, we are all at the mercy of these recommendation algorithms and they don't always behave as we intended either, or as we thought they might, even despite how well we think they know them. And so if you put out a piece of content and it doesn't do very well, it's not necessarily a reflection on the content. It's necessarily a reflection on what the algorithm thinks your audience already likes. And the content is perhaps not in that niche. But I would love to hear all of your thoughts about you know, what you think this could be applicable to in terms of your own science communication, whether that's online or otherwise essentially with the goal of trying to bridge this digital divide that's being policed by recommendation algorithms and stopping certain demographics of people from engaging in science that we so desperately want to be included. So thank you very much. <laughs>